um, there's a real relational aspect of the principal and the students, at least that I've observed, and it's like incredible. It's just very, very wonderful. So I'm just curious, like, can you talk a little <coughs> bit about kind of your relational approach and kind of building those trust bonds with students, having done that at the middle school and kind of bringing that energy down to the elementary level? So we've oh, let's see any um, Lauren or we're, Kristen, we're any questions? Is. Oh, there we go, Kristen. Kristen, go ahead. Yeah. Um, it's great to hear all about all of your experience, Stacey, and thank you for um, all of that. I'm going to sort of play off of Bryce's question too and extend that. Um, it was sounds like you had a wonderful day with the kids, which I'm so excited to hear. I'm wondering, um, you just talked a lot about your relationship with the people in the building. How do you see your relationship with those kids' parents and how if they start coming to you with, my kids said this, I'm like, my kids say a lot of things and I have to take a grain of salt and I love them dearly. But you know, what they tell me happened at school isn't always exactly the right context. Um, but nonetheless, um, how do you see your relationship with the parents who are probably going to be calling or coming in? Absolutely. So I work very closely with parents and usually what I do is try to uh, connect with families. There are certain families that I will be connecting more frequently with. Um, that could be because of certain situations, like maybe the student has to visit me a lot in the office because we see some unexpected behaviors. Um, and so, you know, I'll work with families around that, but I think in general, it's really just making sure that I'm accessible to families, I'm approachable, and they recognize that, you know, my role is to make sure that I'm creating a safe and inclusive environment for our students where families feel comfortable handing their students off to us during the day. Um, because I know that, especially in elementary school, but I think 
Kim gave Phil was probably the root of the root senior year is families always worry about their children when when they're not there. So whether it's a you know a five year old or a eighteen year old, I think there's always some worry there. But I think the goal is just to make sure that there's a lot of communication between home and school and so parents know how they can access me access me when it's necessary. And of course we know that students may not be or children at any age may not be not intentionally the most accurate reporters and so we <laughs> listen to what they have to say, maybe ask some questions, but I think that's why, you know, as as a principal, the principal's there to be able to work through that with families and then ultimately students. Lauren, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Stacy. I don't really have anything new to add. I just wanted to say thank you so much for your thoughtful reflection um, and telling us a little bit about your experience in self -bro. All right, so, um, so thank you, Stacy, for, for your time. And I'm sure you are thrilled that this is the last uh, <laughs> part, of, part of today. So um, it's been quite a grueling process and a rigorous process from our perspective as a, as a district from uh, in a quite a large committee interviewing candidates, going through that process, then visiting um, classrooms at Z School and um, having conversations around what we've observed to um, today where we're actually doing the site visit and visiting classrooms and meeting with the key stakeholders. So um, congratulations on finishing that process. It's, um, it's important to us, as you know, that we hire the best people possible. Um, and I think we're, we're very excited. So in terms of the community, the next step is for um, the team um, at the central office to look at all the feedback surveys from the stakeholder groups um, run through that data tomorrow morning and then um, make a decision um, tomorrow or potentially Friday. So thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Nice meeting so much. you. Feel free to stay till nine o'clock at the end of our meeting. If you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> and Jen, you have four minutes. Um, so our next finalist is Jen Callahan, who is a very familiar face to us. Um, she is the principal finalist for Lincoln Street Elementary School, and, and welcome, Jen. Thank you so much. Can I just say, I'll echo everything that Stacy said. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of background about me. Um, I started the educational process um, my first year out of college um, as a paraprofessional in special education classrooms, also teaching small group math, which was a wonderful introduction to what the educational process looks like and it really um, inspired me to continue with middle school and it was in a seventh grade um, classroom. And so then I taught four years at West Boylston and I taught social studies and ELA um, at West Boylston and then from there I've been here. So I've been here 22 years, 27 years total. Um, I have been in the middle school world which as you know, Stacey also mentioned there will be a learning curve um, I think Part of that experience is it will be different, but I, I have three children. I have raised those three children, so I have seen some of those hiding in the closet and under desk situations. Uh, but I'm really excited to bring my skill set to the elementary level. Um, I got my uh, master's in educational leadership right right out of college, so I was still uh, young and innocent then. Back in the I was in my 20s. And um, I knew at some point I would like to be an educational leader. I'm not, I mean, wasn't sure of like in what capacity. Uh, so then I went into teaching. And then once my youngest was on her way to kindergarten, um, I was fortunate to have, there was an opening here at Millican. Um, Mrs. Carr, who was then the assistant principal, became the principal. And I interviewed for the position here. And so I've been in that leadership role um, for the past eight years here at Millican. And so I, you know, what I'm excited about um, is to use some of those skills, so the operations, right down to the parking lot duty, uh, being out there welcoming kids, welcoming bus drivers, being visible, 
Um, using those skills that I have used here at Mellican and just transfer them down to Lincoln Street. And I know it, it will look a little bit different, but I think that's part of the learning journey that I'm really excited about. And I, I think when I saw that this opportunity presented itself, um, I really thought about, you know, I, I just metaphorically, I'm like, I feel like I've been at the trunk of the tree for about 27 years. Just like the trunk of a tree. And I'd really like to be at the roots, the seedlings, really find out foundationally. How does this process work? What, are, what am I need to learn about phonetic awareness and number sense? Um, anything having to do with literacy and math and computation, and then everything else. Just developmentally the foundations of how kids grow and how we build off of that to prepare them when they do get to fifth grade, and then they transition into sixth grade here. I have been part of that transition for the past eight years. Um, having some of those open house nights, you know, having parents, fifth grade parents come in, we share a little bit about that it's not scary in the middle school, You're, there isn't a pool here, um, you're not going to throw in a locker. So I think that will be great to flip it now, and I'm part of that process with this great team. Um, the other piece that was so uh, appealing to me is that my kids went to the fifth street, that mm. is from 2008 mm. to 2021. Um, three children went through and it was a wow. wonderful experience and I have just the utmost respect and I know that the staff is just a, a group of experts that are going to help me. They're going to help me, be in partner with me, we can collaborate on how we can learn together and really put forth some initiatives and programs but support each other and have this great positive culture that we can learn and welcome families and welcome kids and just build off of that. Thank you so much again for having us tonight. Appreciate it. Great, thank you. Questions from the committee? Um, so I don't know what it's like um, for middle school yet because I'll be there next year. <laughs> but um, for the PTOs are a huge asset to um, the, the elementary schools. I mean, they, they help us out with our budgets. You know, they, they can provide things for it. Um, for them that we can't necessarily squeeze into our budget, they can help and everything. Um, and I remember your presentation here for, um, and you had, uh, you're just getting in with the PTOs and stuff like that. So, um, what do you foresee your involvement with the PTOs and? Uh, so I'm excited about the PTO. Yeah. I think one of those um, <coughs> nice roles that my dear friend, Mrs. Carp, handed over to me this year was, how, how would you like to leave the PTO? We really want to revitalize it, and refresh it, get a, get a real community going, and get share people. So it's been a wonderful experience of having all these people on board, um, thinking about activities, fundraisers, uh, enrichment programs. So by having an actual committee, it has been so great. So I, again, I would like to use that experience because I was really in the mix of it with the committee. Um, and in, in the elementary, I think parents want to be more involved, right? But there's a lot of levels there. It's the community, it's parents, but there's, there's the teachers will need to be involved as well. So it's just what are their needs and how can we have them be part of that partnership? And we want to bring these programs to the school and talk about it. So that's why we have you know, open communication in meetings and brainstorm ideas of things that maybe we want to keep because they're part of our traditions or we want to add and enhance some of our past traditions, or just, just in inviting people <coughs> into the school to be a part of it. I think it's just gonna be a collaborative process. I am very open to that. Um, I, I try to use that skill set of communicating and transparency as much as I can in my current role. So I would like to continue that and really welcome the families. We had a nice group of PTO members come over today at Lincoln Street and it was really refreshing. Uh, and I think here's a little difference. They had a little child on their lap. Um, I did not get a card like Stacy, but I got a little birthday party. So, uh, so I hopefully that answers your question. It does. Thank you so much. Other questions? Um, I'd just like to say, I don't have any questions. I guess I just have reflections. Is that from the time I've been on school committee and you've been here, the enthusiasm that you project over it could be the simplest thing to the most hardest thing to do, but 
I always would sit and go, gee, I wish I was back into the classroom, or I wish I was there as a teacher under your room, because you had always so much excitement and a perpetual smile that gets you through it, and uh, even about nature's classroom. And I think when parents see the video, they also see that and, and feel that there's confidence going through. One of the things that you talked about, which was your parking lot duty, and that's the one I like to expand upon because I did tell Mr. Mel, um, I did tell Greg Martineau last year at the May election when Bryce and I were out there campaigning on the outside of the parking lot, and we had had a lot of discussion among the parents previous saying we should maybe we shouldn't have school on election days, which now does not take place. But last year was the last year that it had happened. And so we don't get to observe principals too much in action other than school committee. So I observed you completely. <laughs> and I thought, how is she going to do walkers, parents dropping off, buses, people voting, OK, that want their cars parked, along with people that are campaigning, right? And you handled it with such grace. No one beep. I didn't hear one horn beep. <laughs> <laughs> Not one kid got lost. Our signs were still there. <laughs> and it was just, I was amazed how you just did it. I mean, you see, you and you were just all smiles. And I think that that, that you project to the parents, make parents and kids to feel very welcome and to feel very safe and inclusive in the classroom and into your school. So I'm sure that I look forward to great things that are going to happen at Lincoln. But that was my story I wanted to tell you. I was watching. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm glad. It, I'm just I gave you like a ticket or something. <laughs> 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 no, you didn't. There weren't any horns, and nobody was lost. No one was lost. Okay. Great. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Did somebody? Lauren Bailey. Yeah. yeah, I saw somebody. Yeah. Go ahead, Lauren. Hi. Um, thank you so I'm sorry for the baby in the background. Um, but I just wanted to say it's been really great seeing the partnership between you and Michelle over these years. Um, and I'm sure it'll be a transition um, heading to the elementary level where you know you don't have a, a direct partnership with someone leading the school. So how are you sort of anticipating those changes? Yes, I thought about that quite a bit, Lauren. And I think about you know how do you build people up and build teams and committees and have a sounding board. And I think even though I don't have a partner, I think there's something to be said about collaboration but also, um, you know, I think you're gonna have to find people to lean on, people that know the building. I think one message that I wanted to send to the Lincoln Street uh, people today is just doing a lot of listening to see what they need. So then that will help kind of di direct me to how I'm going to handle problems or handle situations or um, begin and start events. Uh, so I think that will just be a, a learning process, but also I think when you have a strong enough culture and you have people that want to support you and I want to support them, I, I think that's going to make all the difference in the world. So I, I'm excited about that, but it will be uh, not having you know the partner right aside of you will definitely be a change. And I will miss her. Thank you for that reflection. Thanks, Lauren. I don't have a question so much as just a comment like I think you're gonna be great with the energy you've got like I just think it's fantastic having seen you here with the PTO group and just what I hear from folks I think I think you've got the right the right stuff <laughs> so yeah I'm excited Kristen. Kristen go ahead hi Jen um, thank you for everything that you've shared it's um, been really helpful I I'm wondering, there are a lot of things that have been slow to come back um, after COVID, right? Things like field trips for each grade that used to be in place and other, a lot of the extracurricular activities. I'm wondering how you feel about field trips. Like, are they important? Are they not important at all? Or should they you know, be a must have or not? And what your thoughts are on that sort of outside the classroom type of learning? Thank you. We actually talked a little bit about that today um, in the faculty meeting over at Lincoln Street, but also with the PTO representatives. I absolutely think that field trips are necessary. We want them back in our schools, in our classrooms. An opportunity for an enrichment. Um, it can connect to the curriculum, which I think is really important. 
Um, I think what is really nice is that we have this really close-knit group of NASA leaders and principals. I, I, I think that's the other piece of like, I won't be working in isolation knowing I have you know, Stacy, but also John Bell and Mary Coakley to kind of lean on as mentors, uh, but also uh, sharing ideas. And so I think that would be really a great experience to figure out what really worked as a field trip and how can we get that back in. The also, the other thing that I think is really rewarding for, for students and faculty is having people come in to the building, like that type of enrichment. Uh, kids are so welcoming to uh, different groups that come in, whether it's the magic show or jugglers or a uh, guest author. Um, I think all of those opportunities I really want to see back in our schools. I think it's important and it, it, it could be that one thing that gets a little kiddo through the day and I think that's really important. Everyone needs that touch point and I think I, I want to be part of that. All right, any other questions from the committee? All right, so uh, thank you, Jen. Again, similar process to your colleague, Stacy. so I won't repeat um, the process, but I will share that, um, you know, being an internal candidate applying for these positions um, can often be far more challenging than being an external candidate. Um, so I, I applaud Stacy and you for going through the process. Um, I also just think from a district perspective, um, the leadership team has worked closely with you and Stacy over the past um, many years. So we know um, your strengths and, and what you'll bring to the business. <coughs> so as a district leadership team, we have great confidence in you and Stacy as leaders and really excited about the opportunity for you to um, lead those schools. Um, so thank you. And you know, from a district perspective, it's also nice to know that we have um, internal candidates who are talented and can compete for openings and within our district. I think that's really important. Um, so um, I'm very excited um, for the next chapter for Proctor and for Lincoln Street School. Thank so you thank so you. <clears throat> I appreciate it. Thank you again. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, next order of business is election of officers. Um, and at this time, I will ask the committee members if there is a nomination for chairperson for the upcoming 23-24 um, school year. Joan? Um, I'd like to nominate Kelly Gannett uh, for chairperson of our Northwest School Committee. I think Kelly has done an outstanding job this year. Um, I, and she's kept us in, in touch with uh, emails and with any updates in the community that you share, Greg, with her. So she has, you know, She's done an outstanding job, and I think sometimes it helps after one year, you just get your feet wet, is to go into it for, for a second year. So if that is the will of the committee, I'd like to nominate Kelly Gannett for the second year as uh, chairperson. Second. Motion and a second. And any discussion? Lauren. Um, I support Joan's nomination, um, and I think that there's value in having the continuity of Kelly's leadership, and again, she has done a fantastic job keeping all committee members um, informed about everything going on in the district. Any other discussion? All right, seeing no other discussion, we need a roll call vote. Actually, before I, I should ask Kelly, are you? <laughs> no choices. No, sorry, I don't want to do it. No, I, I thank you very much for your kind words. Um, it was a learning curve last year, I feel. But um, I, as you know, you said, I, I kind of in the groove. And um, I accept the nomination. Um, and uh, I look forward to keeping our meetings as efficient as possible. <laughs> there you talk. <laughs> All right. So we need uh, a roll call vote. So Bryce? Yes. Joan? Yes. Lauren? Yes. Kristen? Yes. Kelly? Yes. Congratulations, Kelly. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> and um, it is with great pleasure that I turn over the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I will take over the rest. All right, so we have um, nominated the chair. Um, we need a vice chair. Um, oh, I Lauren. hear Lauren. I would like to nominate Bryce. 
Great. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion by Lauren and a second by Joan. Uh, any discussion? Yes. I'd just like to say that I think Bryce will do a great job at that. You're only a heartbeat away. And I think that it's good with the vice chair. It's not just a figurehead. I think it's good if the vice chair also sees what the chair is doing because sometime in the future that's going to be your position. <laughs> so I, I think it's a great duo with the two of you in the leadership position. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Um, I concur. I think uh, Bryce did a great job his first year last year, getting involved, jumping in, and mm -hmm. um, I think he'll do great learning more of the ropes. Yeah. So. Um, all right, so it's a roll call vote. Uh, I'll do our phones first, actually. I'll change it up a little bit. Kristen? Yes. Lauren? Yes. Uh, Joan? Yes. Myself? Yes. Bryce? Yes. It's a unanimous vote. Um, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, we need a secretary. Um, the, sec the role of the secretary is mostly for executive sessions since we have a fabulous team at central office who um, will watch these videos back for us and take our notes for us. Um, and um, so it's mostly executive session type things and some meetings that um, will be responsible for note taking. Um, I would like to nominate actually Joan. Oh. Thank you. I second that. Thank you. All right, so we have a motion by myself, Kelly, and a second by Bryce. Um, any discussion? Hearing no discussion, um, I will just say that I think Joan has been on the, the committee for years, um, but for the last few years since I've been on it, she's really taken a step back from the positions um, because she wanted the new people mm -hmm. to get the experience <coughs> and gain the experience, um, which is a real true, you know, mm -hmm. sign of leadership. And, oh, and thank I, you. I appreciate that, um, giving everybody the experience. So um, I think that um, with everybody's circumstances, I think that Joan would be a great person to do it this year. Thank you very much. So. I like to do it. and. Yes, I agree with you. I step back from the leadership positions because I think um, it has to be a shared, it's a shared vision. And with myself not having kids in school, you guys have, you know, all the members other than myself have kids that are involved in the, in the schools and Lauren will have hers in there soon. <laughs> so, and it's good to help out and you guys are doing a great job. So thank you very much for the secretary position. Oh, I have to be voted in, so. <laughs> uh, yeah. Kristen? Yes. Lauren? Yes. Bryce? Yes. Myself as a yes, and Joan? Yes. Thank you. All right. It's a unanimous decision. Congratulations, Joan. Thank you. Thanks. Um, <coughs> the last um, order of business is the superintendent's union. Um, it's comprised of three members. Um, historically, it used to be the senior most members, but um, the last few years we've kind of pulled away from that and kind of just do three, um, three members. Um, one of them has to be the chair, and then the other two are kind of open for nominations. Um, again, I think unless I hear anybody else moving, I'll, I'd like to make a nomination of myself, obviously, uh, Joan and Bryce, since we're the three people who showed up here tonight. No. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to draw. The lucky part? disc. <laughs> be careful, people might not be showing up. They're not going to be showing up anymore. Everyone's going to be like, can I have an owl? I need an owl. Speaking of owl. I second the nomination. <laughs> <laughs> and Lord, so a motion by myself, Kelly, and a second by Lauren. Any discussion? Uh, just a clarification. Uh, when you talked about the union, that Northboro would be taking the chairpersonship. Uh, the superintendent's union number three is made up of three members from the Northboro K-8 to and three from the Southboro K-8. to And when we get to a combined meeting, which will happen June 15th? Yes, next Thursday. Next, mm -hmm. 
Wow. Next Thursday. Um, <coughs> that's when we will elect a chair, and it, and it rotates every year. Whoever has the chair, whatever town has the chairpersonship of, of the region, the other town will have the chairpersonship of the union. And then the regional chair and the union chair work together to do the work with the superintendent to establish his goals in the summertime. Uh, run usually four meetings uh, th interspersed throughout the year and also work on the evaluation of the superintendent. So that was the reason I brought up the question to Stacy about evaluations because it's a hard one for us to believe it or not uh, to do it but it, it's a worthwhile experience so I just wanted to do the clarification of that chair will be elected next Thursday. All righty. Um, Roll call vote. Kristen? Yes. Lauren? Yes. Bryce? Yes. Joan? Yes. Myself is a yes. So congratulations to us union members. <laughs> um, I am going to pass the next um, agenda item of recognition of retirees over to Superintendent Martino. Get my gifts Get organized. Gifts. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh my goodness. <laughs> there are more textbooks. Policy <laughs> <laughs> <I'll see> manuals. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Good evening, and um, for those of you who do not regularly attend school committee meetings, welcome. This is what you've been missing for many years. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I'd first I'd like to ask Michelle Carr to join me. Uh, I'm going to recognize a couple of retirees from Malachi. Um And the first person we're going to recognize, recognize is uh, Jan Bissett, so Dean Kamana. <laughs> So um, we are actually in Jan's home space, <laughs> where she has been the Malkin librarian for many years. Um, and if you ever have a chance to visit the library uh, when kids are in session, um, it is a warm, welcoming, uh, wonderful place to be. It's the type of place where I feel like some days I could Maybe I'll just stay here. Um, you come in somewhere. I do. <laughs> uh, but Jan is kind of a passionate educator. She's been um, taking on many roles over the years. I think in 1998 or 1999, you started substituting, and I think you left a little bit to go to Berlin Boylston, right. and then came back. Bob Elkin, I believe, had to come back. Yes, he did. Yes, so, so we have been. That's that that lovely. I got yes. hired with a hug. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, uh, the students have been the beneficiary of Jan and her, her um, mentorship and her expertise and her kindness um, and love for kids. So, so thank you for all of Yes, I would just add that um, in Jan's 18 years here, um, I cannot think of a more positive uh, presence in the building, a more collaborative presence and a more flexible person. Um, this space is um, sometimes in high demand, and even though Jan has students that she is responsible for, um, sometimes she has a class, um, and she will still gladly um, let us use her space for speakers, for teachers to have classes, for different events throughout the day. Um, and Jan very willingly says, no problem, I can move or send them up, and we, they can join my class. So um, <laughs> Jan is extremely, um, again, very welcoming all students and all staff always willing to help in any way um, and I think beyond this building I know Jan has been extremely collaborative with the other librarians um, in the district as well as our town librarian so I think it's been um, just a wonderful presence um, and we are definitely going to miss um, the knowledge um, and the positive energy and the spirit that Jan, that Jan brings to it. So. But the positive news is that when she immediately retires, Heather Richards will be reaching out uh, to make sure she has her substitute papers. <laughs> 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 I'll, I'll check my manuscript. <laughs> yeah, she's going to be 
Thank you very much. So we have a small token of appreciation on behalf of the school committee. We wish you nothing but the best, and you are always welcome. Thank you all for letting me be here for all that. And there'll be more next week. Next we have Dominique Bobal. <laughs> so um, Dominique has been a world language teacher for, for many years at, at Malik, and I think she started in 2004, so it's been a long, a long tenure. And uh, she's been an outstanding educator, um, a leader in world language education, um, cares deeply about students um, and teaching them about language, but also about culture. Um, and she will be deeply missed. And one thing that um, I think a little known, unknown fact is that she is also a doctor. Um, so she um, is a medical doctor. She went to uh, medical school in France um, and uh, occupational therapy also as well. Occupational medicine. Yes, so um, she is also welcome back in time. <laughs> <laughs> gets more and more challenging and so I felt very lucky to have Dominique to um, teach our students uh, French, uh, to teach them about the culture um, and I think similar to Jan, Dominique has been flexible. Um, one thing that really stands out to me is throughout the pandemic when we had students who were hybrid, students who were fully remote, um, Dominique taught some students over lunch just so she could keep them learning French. Um, students who willingly met with Dominique to receive French instruction that way remotely. Um, I don't know how many uh, periods we over, Peter. Um, probably a violation of her time. <laughs> Do you feel like <laughs> so, no, and I think Dominique always was um, looking for more and looking always to improve her craft um, in and thinking about different ways of using technology and other kinds of things to get kids excited about technology, singing, dancing, acting, all sorts of different kinds of things. So uh, we're very much going to miss Dominique as well. Um, and um, with, with Dominique goes our French teacher, so if anyone's looking for a French <laughs> <laughs> So congratulations. <laughs> and as a, again, on behalf of the school committee and the district, we have a small token of our appreciation. You've been a wonderful employee, you'd be greatly missed, and you are also welcome to come back and sub it. So next, um, from Lincoln Street School and Algonquin Regional High School, we have Linda Boot and Hagen. So Linda has been um, utility player on many fronts. She has um, worked at Lincoln Street School, she's worked at Algonquin, uh, Peasley School. Um, some years it's been 50, 50 splits, other years it's 80-20, it's all time over the, the map in terms of uh, she's been flexible. Um, she has been a um, speech and language um, age, a solid state assistant, um, and has been a ter terrific and I know that you will be greatly missed um, for your expertise. Um, and we do have, um, again, on behalf of the district um, and the school committee, we have a small part of our So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and you are also welcome back at <laughs> You know, for the retirement, um, encore career doesn't work out. <laughs> uh, you know how is speech and language um, pathologist? We all we need a ton of, a ton of expertise. So um, I had to double look at the years of experience. We have next we have Susan Soden. Is that, is that I think that's a typo. Nineteen ninety four. Five. Oh. 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 
1995, um, Susan has been working on our food services department um, here at Melody School. No, Proctor. Proctor. Sorry, Proctor. Proctor. <laughs> yeah. um, Proctor um, and has decided to retire from her job. Um, food service is such an important part of the daily experience for our students. Um, you cared about the work deeply. Um, you connect with kids on a daily basis. You've um, been an outstanding um, person. You've been an impact to the kids and will be greatly missed. The good news is that Susan is also um, works for our transportation department. That's <laughs> <laughs> is the S15 driver and will continue in that capacity, which we are, which keep really forever. <laughs> and again, if, if you ever need um, something to do, you know, you know the food service, you know the you know, any of our kitchens in North Pro need need a help. I'll be happy to district and the school committee to respond with the cards. Um, the next on the agenda is audience sharing. We have a full audience tonight. Um, Terry, where do you want, is this the best spot? Okay, so for anybody who would like to share anything, um, please come step up to the table. Um, state your name and your address. And just to um, remind audience members that there is no dialogue that will occur with any of us it's more for you to share with us and then we will make notes of things and um, follow up back with you so All right, I guess I'm the yeah Hi, Terry will let you go oh, yes come sit with her near Mike oh, come yeah. sit near Mike okay All right. sounds good Thank you. do I need to sit down should I sit down you don't have okay to. all right I can sit down <laughs> 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 all right uh, hi uh, my name is Amar Jalil. I'm uh, at 392 Hudson Street. I'm a parent of a first grader at Z School. I wanted to thank Kelly for inviting me over today because she's also uh, a teacher of my preschooler. Um, so the one thing that I wanted to share about is the school lunch program. I understand the school lunch program is on discussion today. Um, amazing uh, that you've been able to provide uh, free lunches for the kids for the past two years. Uh, I'm sure what that's, what that's gonna hap what's gonna happen in the next year, but that's not the point that I wanted to bring up today. The thing that I wanted to bring up is, uh, as background, uh, we are Muslims, and as Muslims, uh, we mostly eat halal meat. Um, so when we're outside, uh, we don't eat meat and mostly eat vegetarian food or seafood. Um, the one concern that I have is that the uh, lunch programs do not have uh, adequate vegetarian options or seafood options for uh, the students. Um, so I was just wondering how the lunch program could actually incorporate uh, the diet uh, constraints of uh, those that are not um, everyday eaters, right? So the, I have been in touch with Kyle Parsons, who's the lunch coordinator, um, and have expressed these concerns. The one concern that, uh, so what I was told was that there are arrangements for children on days that there is meat, that if there is pasta with meat sauce, they would provide pasta with vegetarian sauce. But that hasn't been one of those things that has been fairly steady. My son always comes home and he says, I was not offered uh, this uh, food, the kid can only eat so much bagel and cream cheese every day or um, peanut butter or some butter and jelly. So the other thing that I was wanting to bring up over here was that when there are, for an every day, 
if a kid is eating bagels or peanut butter or some butter one day or two days, that's great. But the lunch program, the way that it's designed, there are weeks that all five days or four out of five days is meat, right? I mean, so if it's if one is unable to provide a vegetarian or and a non-vegetarian meat uh, option the same day, could it be arranged in such a way that there are not every day is meat, some days you provide vegetarian and others uh, non-vegetarian. So at least have the balance of non-meat versus meat uh, in, in the week. So that's my uh, thing that I wanted to share. And I understand that the lunch program is being discussed today. So if you guys could consider this as part of the discussion and the lunch program, I would appreciate that. That's all. Thank that you so much. Thank <coughs> you. Any other? Peter, come on up. I'll sit down, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, Peter Olson, uh, North Road Teachers Association uh, president. And I just have a, a couple of things I, I'd like to first um, recognize at the end of the year um, and thank quite heavily the, uh, the work that was done with the school committee and the association to uh, successfully negotiate uh, to what I consider to be really good contracts. Um, and not just that the contracts were good, but the process was just uh, such a, a nice team experience uh, where everybody was heard and all sides felt like they left the table feeling pretty good about where things were. So thank you very much. And I bring that up now because I just signed them. So <laughs> we're all good. So. <laughs> the other is um, at the uh, Northboro uh, Teachers Associ Association annual meeting, uh, a discussion was held and a vote uh, passed to support the MTA legislation to eliminate high stakes uh, testing, the MCAS around uh, the high stakes piece of it. Uh, it's called the Thrive Act. And uh, <coughs> I was I was, a, as a part of the annual meeting, asked to uh, share a little bit about what the Thrive Act is to see if um, I can garner some support from the school committee. So uh, just kind of real quickly, I'm going to read this off what I have. Uh, Massachusetts is one of eight states in the U.S. that still ties its standardized test to graduation. That's down from 24 states in 2014, uh, making us an extreme outlier. Our state's MCAS-based graduation requirement has resulted in the denial of high school diplomas to thousands of students based on a single flawed high-stakes test uh, forever hampering the future while failing as a tool for student assessment. There's no correlation between having a standardized graduation exam requirement and academic achievement. Instead, we know that teacher assessments provide much more meaningful and timely information about an individual student's knowledge of their skills and their needs. Similarly, multiple studies have shown that high school GPA is a stronger predictor of college success than standardized test scores. The punitive aspects of the MCAS are especially detrimental to students with individualized educational plans, student learning, uh, st sorry, uh, students learning English as a second language, students of color, and students from groups that have been historically marginalized from an equitable and supportive education. As educators, we are most trusted spokespeople on educational policy issues, and we must reject the punitive aspects that high-stakes testing brings to our students and our communities that we serve. So U.S. community leaders can help by supporting this important legislation. Um, I can share more with uh, the superintendent later uh, and, and have him bring it to you or later meetings share with you. Um, but that's what I have. So thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. Thank you so much, Thank Peter. You. Any other audience sharing? Um, I would like to say, since we kind of, I didn't welcome the meeting and call it an order, I do want to welcome our new member, and it's hard sometimes to tell, but um, she's on the owl tonight, so she's not present. But we have a new member sitting at the table, um, and it's Kristen Tijan. And uh, so I just wanted to offer her a welcome um, tonight. And um, she hasn't, she told me that she hasn't traveled for work in over five years. And um, this week she's traveling uh, for the first time in five years, like ever. And of course, it's the first time of the school committee. So um, she was very um, 
apologetic for having it, you know, be here, um, unable to be in person. But when I offered her the option to remotely come in, she was very excited by that. Um, so uh, welcome, Kristen. Um, and we look forward to you seating, sitting next to us um, come September. Yeah. Kristen, go ahead. Thank you, Kelly. Yes, I, I was a little dismayed <laughs> when they told me the timing of the conference that I was now going to. <laughs> I realized it was a conflict. I would much rather be a person. But I appreciate your welcome, and I'm excited to work um, with you all. Uh, and I think I'll see you next Thursday, right? Hopefully. Oh, yes, yeah, you will. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thursday. Yeah, combined. I'm excited to um, for the next three years to work with you guys. Thanks. All right. New business, principal reports. So this evening we have Michelle Carb, Principal Carb, Principal Bell, and Principal Coakley here to provide the year-end wrap-up uh, of principal reports. There are lots of uh, great field trips that are going on in the month of June. Uh, fifth grade last week walked to the Freedom Trail in Boston. They didn't walk to it. They walked to the Freedom Trail. <laughs> <laughs> Second grade, uh, we're going to the South of Zoo next week. Third grade is going to Tower Hill next week. And our first graders walked to the North World Public Library um, last week. Our PTO fully funded these trips, um, and they've been a wonderful extension of the learning that's happening in the classroom, which is great that we were able to bring those back. Um, this week we screened our kindergartners for next year um, to learn more about those incoming students and we're eager to have 41 uh, new excited students and families that are going to be joining the Z community next year and as we get ready to welcome this new group we're also celebrating our fifth graders that are going to be leaving us and moving on to Nellican. Um, the fifth graders will be going to Camp Marshall next week um, to have some fun as a group and celebrate their time at Z. And on the 21st, we'll have our fifth grade promotion at 1.30 and then a picnic celebration after school. Um, we're going to be sad to see them let go, but we also know that they're ready for this next part of their educational journey, and we're going to wish them well as they leave. Um, and it also, as I reflect on my first year as a principal at Z, um, I really am amazed at everything that we've been able to accomplish in the school. I'm looking forward to building on that momentum next year. So that's every principal around <coughs> I'm also going to share for Proctor, since Alana was unable to be here this evening. Um, and she said that June has been an exciting and busy month at Proctor. They kicked off the month on Friday, June 2nd, by hosting their annual field day. Students spent the entire day outdoors playing a variety of games. Fun was had by all, and a big thank you to Mr. Ferreria um, for organizing the day and to the many family volunteers. Um, on Tuesday, they welcomed their incoming kindergarten caregiver for an orientation. The orientation helped families become familiar with what to expect during their child's first year of kindergarten. And the fifth graders attended a field trip to the Hands on Nature in Berlin on Tuesday, while the third graders went to the Worcester Braveheart scheme today. Both grade levels enjoyed their experiences and had a great time. Um, the Proctor fifth graders will be recognized for their time at Proctor as they prepare to transition to middle school. The fifth graders will celebrate their accomplishments with a ceremony on Friday, June 16th. And they're very proud of the hard work and know that they will shine in Melvin notice a lot of the common themes that <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll start with Lincoln Street. In our busy month of school, we're thrilled to announce that our fourth and fifth grade students will be participating in the Understanding Our Differences program. Thanks to the dedicated leadership of Dr. Lipton O'Connor and Mary Ellen Doug. This interactive curriculum promotes empathy and understanding, fostering respect and inclusion for people with diverse abilities. Our first LSS STEM night was a huge success. Organized by our STEM committee and fourth grade teacher, Kat Dale, the event saw the enthusiastic participation from 17 families and a total of 65 participants. The footwear with a purpose challenge stole the show, showcasing our students' teamwork, problem solving, and critical thinking skills. Students in grade three through five will have an opportunity to participate on Thursday. A heartfelt thank you goes to the LSS PTO for generously sponsoring our upcoming science enrichment programs, allowing us to bring in experts from the Discovery Museum. Their support enhances our students' learning and fosters a love of science. Mark your calendars for the annual LSS Field Day on Friday, June 9th, with a rain date of the 16th. 
This year's theme, Out of This World, is suggested by a fourth grade student, Yassine. Get ready for an extraordinary day of space-inspired games and activities. Special thanks to our dedicated PE teacher, Mrs. Rollins, and the incredible parent community for their invaluable support in making this day a resounding success. As the school year draws to a close, we prepare to bid farewell to our remarkable fifth grade students who will be embarking on an exciting new journey in the middle school this fall. It has been incredibly rewarding to witness their growth and development throughout their years at LSS. We are immensely proud of their accomplishments and the individuals they have become. We, we wish them every success in their future endeavors and know that they will continue to thrive and shine in all that they pursue. At Peasley, we've been checking off our to-do list. Some of, these t <coughs> some of these tasks include transition meetings, finalizing <coughs> class lists, ordering supplies, building schedules for the new school year. The halls are filled and bustling with special year-end events and celebrations. These include enrichments, understanding our differences, field days, author picnics, plays, concerts, and art shows. The best part is the celebration of our oldest students together. They out these outstanding fifth graders will be recognized during a graduation ceremony. We have welcomed parents from many of these special events. Even our incoming parents <coughs> and orientation with their kindergartners and the newest case students will come to Peasley this week <coughs> to join our current case students and to watch the Pumpernickel players perform. Our fantastic PTO has an end-year celebration planned for this weekend. Not sure if it will take place Friday or Sunday. Um, everyone is so excited to come together to share memories and make new ones. The PTO has a special end-of-year luncheon for staff that is planned. We're very thankful for their support and appreciation of teachers and staff this year. We are also incredibly proud of our accomplishments and successes we have had this year. The staff at Peasley and throughout our district have worked extremely hard. They have strengthened their leadership abilities through shared decision making and collaboration, all in support of our learners. During June staff meetings, we shared the contributions we made in our work within our school improvement plans. We all continue to be committed to including innovative learning experiences for our students and to support our teachers in a common vision forward. Thank you for your interest and support in all of our work at the elementary schools this year. <coughs> um, as it is for all schools, June is also busy um, at Malikin. We continue our transition planning for our incoming sixth graders as well as our outgoing eighth graders. We have small group tours to Algonquin, transition meetings with ACIVIT, and many other events scheduled before June 22nd to finalize these important transitions for our students and families. We welcomed our fifth graders last week for their building tours and panel discussions with current sixth grade students and counselors. We are excited to welcome all of them to Malikin in August. Last week, students in our seventh grade science classes engaged in dissection of squid and crayfish and our 8th grade science classes experimented with coding challenges and immersive VR experiences. Our 8th graders also completed their civics action projects in ELA and social studies classes last week, so we are still very much involved in learning. Over the past week, our 8th grade small vocal ensemble has been traveling to each elementary school to perform and to serve as ambassadors for our choral program here at Melkin. Last night, we held our 7th and 8th grade choral concert, and we have our <coughs> rescheduled color run tomorrow after school, and our 8th grade band and choral concert tomorrow night. This week, our 6th graders are also racing their CO2 cars, a favorite culminating tradition for all of our students. On Monday, we conclude our spring concert series with our 7th and 8th grade band concert, and on Friday night, our 8th graders will celebrate with their traditional farewell dance. Our final food drive of the year to collect items for our North Coral School pan Food Pantry uh, also takes place next week. And then the final week of school, our eighth grade field day, our presidential awards breakfast for students, and our eighth grade graduation take place. Graduation will be at nine o'clock and it will be held outside on June 22nd, weather permitting. In case of inclement weather, the ceremony will take place Thank you so much. Um, John, congratulations on your first year, you and your first year. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Um, look forward to the years coming ahead. Um, and uh, Michelle, I am excited that the color run was postponed from last week to this week because now I can come. Yeah. <laughs> we were offered the invitation to come, if you remember from the last meeting. Mm -hmm. They told mm -hmm. us that we're welcome to mm -hmm. pop by and see if okay. we want to see it. So that's why I'm taking it up. But I will be coming just to check it out to see it because I'm um, excited by that. Yeah. And uh, my daughter did um, come last week to the sixth grade um, mm. orientation, and she did not want to come to middle school. She was not looking forward to it. After coming, she was a, a little bit excited. A little there, bit there. excited. So, <laughs> so, it, so whatever you did, thank you, because that's like a huge come from where she was. So, yeah, look, look, very excited for that. So, um, anything from any other? I'd just like to say thank you for the wonderful year, um, and I hope you have a wonderful summer. And John, I know one of the first meetings in September or October, you mentioned that you had a certain percentage of kids' <laughs> names mastered. So I'm not putting you on the spot, but now it's the end of the year. How'd you do? I think I got them all. <gasps> oh, good. I think so. Every once in a while, there's one I mixed Let's up. Let's hear them. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yeah, we're going to put pictures on the screen. Name that child. <laughs> um, no, but and I think that you've had a wonderful year. And I just had a question. You know, while we have the principals here, because we're going to have two new principals at the elementary level, even though there's seasons and veteran teachers, do just as you have a mentor program for teachers, do you have a mentor program for principals? Yes, and who better to speak about that is than John, who just spent the year. So yes, we do have a uh, mentor okay. program. Okay. Um, Dr. Reinhorn um, um, and myself and the principals work together around what type of support do, um, mm -hmm. does a new person need uh, entering the position. So we will have those conversations with the new principals. Um, and Mary, you know, John and Michelle are part of that process as well. Um, I think the colleague connection is really important in terms of having a good start as a principal. No, I agree, and I think, you know, going from the, both of the assistant principals coming down from a middle school level, there just may be just something where you need a, they need a quick answer, so they can just go and answer that and call their mentor and just say, okay, what is this, how do I deal with this, or, you know, that type of thing, or somebody wants to have a book fair, do we do it, do we not do it, you know, mm -hmm. so I think that's a really good idea. Thank you. So. You, you two are now the senior members. <laughs> you graduated fast. Right? <laughs> <laughs> You're going away. Have a great summer. All right, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Because should we move it up? We can, yeah. So maybe after. i do it now. Can we do it now? Okay. Um, Michelle. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I, I thought that maybe since um, F, educational policy, is for you, I thought maybe, unless you, unless you really want to wait. <laughs> I really want to let these two wonderful yes. people <laughs> be sitting here. That would be wonderful if we could go next. Okay. Thank okay. you so much. Thanks. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> and he is ready to go. I'll project the uh, food services from my computer. Yeah, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, so we are here tonight. Um, I'm here with Sandy Dable and um, Christine Missy. They are our team leaders for sixth grade. Um, and people probably remember that we used to traditionally take our sixth graders on an overnight field trip in the fall. We um, went to Stone. Um, environmental school and um, we did that for approximately 15 years um, and then in 2019 that ended so um, we are through the, the pandemic um, and we are ready to ask um, the school committee at this time to grant permission for us to um, bring back this wonderful experience for our sixth graders and we think we have found a wonderful replacement opportunity so we're here tonight to share with you um, and hopefully get your blessing to move forward. Yes. Oh. <laughs> 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 
tried to do some research, try to find another school that we could possibly look into and, and replace the Stone Environmental School, and that was the ecology school. Fast forward a little bit, March of 2020 occurred, and we were shut down, um, and followed by a few years beyond that where we had um, restrictions as to what we could and couldn't do, and obviously field trips, especially overnight, we're going to be canceled, so we couldn't do that. So it wasn't until really um, late winter, early spring, that I started kind of thinking about getting something started again, and had lots of conversations with Michelle and Jen and called the ecology school up again as well. Um, and the ecology school we had thought was a very similar experience. Christine's gonna talk more about that, um, to that of Stone. So um, that's kind of where we're at and all that needs to tell you about the ecology school. So as Sandy said, they previously had started uh, just looking for another place to look at Stone and they came across the ecology school, which is in Saco, Maine. And if you go to the next slide, they have 20 years of experience and uh, they recently rebuilt uh, a school or built a school that is completely sustainable, living off the land, kind of doing, you know, living what they teach. And um, they kept saying to us, we have a very close relationship to Stone and they do very much the similar uh, curriculum uh, as Stone did. So knowing that they have the same overnight experiences, the outdoor experiences, they have this um, acreage of community with walking trails they are next to the river, they have forest lessons, uh, they have food lessons, they have hands-on experiences, so the students can actually have the same kind of experience that they would have had if they went to Stone. Uh, if you want to hit the next, that's fine. Uh, so at the Ecology School, um, they, we had definitely filled out an application already. We sent a deposit previous to COVID occurring, so we'd already set up a relationship with the school, and we, Sandy and I, just visited the site and talked to their head um, director, Alex, and um, met with the CEO and president as well. Mm -hmm. uh, he came out and greeted us, so if you want to go to the next slide. Just a few of the things that we saw. They have their own farm, they're living off the land, they're growing their own foods, some of which they'll use in their um, cafeteria to serve. Um, they have dorm style living, look very much like the little bunk beds um, and shared space. So this is their building where they have their uh, the kids' dorm, the teacher's dorm in the same area so that we can monitor them. They have their um, family style cafeteria, very similar to Stone. Um, they have different kinds of classrooms, not just outside with the different seating, but they also have yurts that they've set up. They can use as activities and classrooms. Um, they said they were gonna think about maybe setting them up for sleeping arrangements for some of the teachers someday, but not yet. <laughs> I just really excited. When Sandy and I went to visit, it really felt like a campus feel, and it was natural, and it was um, great to see how they were using the land and really kind of teaching that you can live off the land. And what we liked the best is it's not only connecting to the science curriculum um, and how to be kind to your environment, but as a social studies teacher, um, it's nice to connect to how we use our environment because we teach about that whole interaction of the humans and the environment. So it's two curriculums that can be touched upon to help with the hands-on outside school experience. So, um, 
so we're here tonight asking for your permission, permission mm -hmm. to allow us to go and bring you sixth graders for next year to the ecology school. Thank you so much for your presentation. Appreciate Thank it. Um, so would it be the same idea as that you're taking half beginning of the week and then half the end of the week? OK. And what um, financial impact is that for us and for families? So um, I can answer that. So <clears throat> the cost is um, $375 for families. Um, the P that is with the PTO. Um, giving about four thousand dollars toward it so it is still um a, f a financial ask of families so i think if this is approved we want to begin communicating with fifth grade families i mean in the past when we did attend stone we communicated at um the fifth grade parent orientation night um so this is a little bit later however we are planning on going to the school in november whereas we used to go to stone in september so it, it feels like there's a little bit more time on that end, um, but it definitely is a financial ask of families. And um, have you had, in pa previous years, I know every year is different, but um, have there been families that cannot go? Are there scholarships offered? Or so what do the kids do here that aren't? Or uh, do they just go to the other half? Yeah, so here, um, so what happens every year is about, or at least it has historically, when we went to Stone, about 10 percent of um, families and students decided not to go, not for financial reasons, but that they didn't want to go. So those students who stay back, um, they do um, attend classes with the kids who are back here, uh, but there is an overlap day, which is the Wednesday, when one group's going up and one group's coming back. So in the past, that's been maybe 20 kids, and we provide um, a special experience for them where they are exploring like the wetlands that are, you know, we have a vernal pool out back here, there's some other things that we can do here. So there are staff that stay back as well and try to make that an interactive and, and um, outdoor experience for those kids. In terms of the financial piece of it, um, the PTO, um, the way we do the financial requests is they go through me. Um, the parents can just contact me. And then the PTO will pay the full amount up front. And we ask that families reimburse half of that. That's basically a 50% scholarship for anybody. Okay. Um, of course, there are times when people cannot pay those back, and the PTO is willing to just absorb that. So we want to make this accessible to everybody. Um, so um, you know, again, it's been several years, and the cost of everything has gone up a bit. So we do recognize that it is um, it, it is something that that's going to require some planning for families, um, but we are prepared to support those who need it. Any other questions, John? Um, I think it's a wonderful work experience to go to. Um, we went to a nature's classroom when I was a teacher. And the teachers would sleep in a dormitory in a separate room. So is that how the teachers do it here? There is a, in other words, there is an adult with them. Correct. Mm -hmm. At all times. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and one of the slides, it mentioned that um, an on-site nurse was available. Mm -hmm. Do we still have, I don't know what the, cap the capability is, do we has, have our own nurse go or do we rely upon that nurse who is on site so what happens is um, it's a lot of work for our nurses up front um, and families communicate really closely with our nurses so we have any kind of medications all kind of all medical stuff that we need and there's a handoff to the nurse up there um, they're in very close contact with the nurse that is at this school um, so that meds can be distributed any kinds of um, medical issues are known and that information is shared um, so that and then while we are there there's communication back and forth if there needs to be. so that's very important and it's um, I'm assuming they do the same thing that Stone did but but it has always worked really well because the nurses are there's a lot of communication back and forth and they're on site 24 hours okay do any of the staff from the ec from this uh, ecology school do they come down and talk with the with the two of you and go over some things I mean I mean, you have to worry about if there's allergies, you know, somebody has asthma or something, if they have to have an inhaler. And then just what was brought up in our audience sharing, dietary needs that somebody may have. So that, 
that the, is something that's very important. Yep. And so all of this we have dealt with in the past with stone. So this is the replacement. And um, I think in terms of, we'll kind of work backwards, but in terms of dietary requests, restrictions, whatever, um, there are many, many options. And we have staff that go who have their own dietary needs and they're able to accommodate all of them. Yeah. So that is never a worry. Um, and, and we have families connect to them through us so that we are really sure that mm -hmm. there are a lot of options for kids in terms of eating. Um, so that is um, taken care of. And then in terms of allergies and all of that, EpiPens, all of that kind of stuff, the, again, the communication is frequent and it's very detailed and thorough. So families fill out a consent with all the health stuff because we want to make sure all, all of that is in the right person's hands. Mm -hmm. So just as a student here who has an EpiPen, for example, the student up there has the EpiPen. Um, mm -hmm. so, and, and so all of that stuff is um, considered and taken very seriously. Um, of course, we're taking students two hours, this is two hours away, um, and we want to make sure that we have everything that we need. So I think it's a leap of faith for families, and it's a really, it's a nice way, I think, to bridge um, elementary to middle, and mm -hmm. that's through handoff. It's a big trust, um, a big trust factor, and I think it always goes really, really well. Uh, it's not ever perfect. There are always things that happen, certainly. Um, but I think it's a, it's just it's worth all of the planning and all of the mm -hmm. time um, and the commitment that um, the staff is willing to put into it. We have a lot of people who are willing to chaperone. We weren't sure. I said, let's see what the interest is. You know, it's going to be a wonderful idea. But if we don't have staff to go, we have plenty of staff to go. So mm -hmm. we're really excited. Um, males, females, whatever. We, we have it covered. We also need to make sure that. This is accessible to all students, um, neurodiverse students, um, students with any kind of physical <coughs> needs. So in the past, we have had, you know, there have been times when parents have gone up and stayed off site so that the child could sleep off campus if that was needed. Um, we have special education liaisons and aides go. Um, we have counselors there at both, both um, sessions. There will be at least one of our counselors there, sometimes two, depending on the need. So um, yeah, we're really excited about it and, and excited to be able to provide access to everybody. I think it's great that you're going in the fall because it's, you know, my firsthand experience was going in the fall and, and especially when the kids are new, sixth grade, mm -hmm. uh, they're just forming new relationships and especially with the teachers. They love, you know, evening shows and, you know, charades, all those type of things. But I think it's great bonding for the kids at that time and what you established there and that bonding will continue for the rest of the year. Along with that, I had a question if, because the momentum that comes from that is just so rich. The kids may just, who never had an interest in uh, anything in ecology, but all of a sudden does. I would suggest, if you want to, is to go through the NEF Foundation and see if you can get funding, the things that you may want to support the learning that has taken place at this ecology and bring it back into the classroom. I don't know if they do funding, but that would be a good idea to do. Last question, transportation. Is it school buses or coach? No, it's double A, um, probably. Uh, transportation, we are working on just making sure that we're able to have buses, so it is um, coach. Um, not the nicest, nicest <coughs> coach, but, but they're coach buses. Yeah. How far is it? Two, Two hours. hours. Yeah. It's almost on the dot. We didn't, yeah. we didn't have any traffic, so. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, and I should mm -hmm. also say that there, one, the principal and assistant, we've split. Usually one of us goes for one half and one goes for the other half. Okay. So it's nice for us also to get to know the kids in that way. That's good. Um, and it's a shared experience for all of us, so it's, it's, it's really nice. Kids, historically, um, the end of eighth grade is one of the things that they read about in their mm -hmm. speeches. Oh yeah, definitely. Thank you very much for answering my questions. Owl? Kristen. Yes, um, thank you so much for all the hard work you put into this, you know, going up there researching it, sort of writing about the logistics. Um, I have two questions. One would be how you're going to handle um, devices, student devices, if there's a policy in place for if they can bring things, when they can use them, or if they're left at home entirely. Um, the other question would be what the sort of security situation is like there. I, don't, I think I heard you say that an adult is with them at all times, um, but do the doors lock? Is it sort of out in the open? Is it you know gated by itself? What's the, the landscape like? 
I'll address the dorms first. Uh, the security, especially in the sleeping part, the dorms have a keypad lock, so you have a number to enter so strangers can't get in. So anytime there are students in the dorm building, there's a teacher with them at any time, and they're usually in the dorms for a certain set of hours. So um, when that break time is, or the shower time, or bedtime, teachers are with them, and students are not supposed to go to the dorms unless they are with the teacher or during those designated times. So it's not a free-for-all. Um, it's very well scheduled. Um, in the groupings and with their teams. And it's always also a buddy system, so the students are not going by themselves either. Um, for the devices, uh, the policy up at the ecology school is that they um, do not have cell phones. So that's how we discuss that and handle that. We, you know, I think we would have those conversations with Michelle when we talk to the, the students about that as well, but their sort of rule of thumb is that it's a, um, what do they say? No disconnected. Disconnected environment, um, uh, no screens, that's sort of how they run things up there. And so. they, they realize that students <coughs> are probably going to have devices on the buses, but a lot of times if students go with them, um, they will collect them at the beginning. It's contraband, quote unquote. Yeah. Um, and they'll put them in those back bags and label them and they'll put them somewhere safe, locked up. And then at the end of their visit, they get them back before they get on the buses so they'll be safe and sound. Yeah. And of course, communication is always open. If you need to contact the school, that's mm -hmm. open. Students are with teachers, so you can call. And, and, and they have a system in place too. Like they've been dealing with this with students for a few years now with the cell phones, so they, they have a good way of that. I love that. Thank you. Um, and am I correct in assuming that the, the keypads, like only the teachers have, would know the number to the keypad, right? Our understanding is the staff and the teachers know the ones who have those, yes. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kristen. Yeah, so just a couple points, of just questions of clarification. So um, just thinking about the over the overarching costs. So the PTO puts down 4K, no questions asked. That goes towards the total cost. And then from that, you get down to the 375 per family. How many families roughly I'm at? You know, is it if I've got two kids that are in sixth grade, is it 375 ahead or is it 375 for the family? It's each. Yeah, okay. So each student is 375. Student. Okay. And you said only about 10% stay back? That's what happened historically. Now, again, we haven't done anything since 2018. So. And on average, how many sixth grade students are there? There will be about 175 next year. Uh, all right. So you're getting 160 kids to go up to this thing. Uh, all right, so I'm going to do some math on my own time to figure out kind of what else we might be able to do to get that funding down because that is kind of an ask for families to put that up. Um, the only other maybe thing a color run. Huh? That's part of it. <laughs> what? I said maybe a color run. Color run, whatever. Because like <laughs> my next statement is go more often, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, thanks. Question for Greg. Um, what type of insurance do we cover for this? Is this school responsible? So it is a school field trip, so our school insurance policy would and cover this trip and I'm sure that the ecology school also has insurance and um, we can have Becky work on getting the yeah. details of what Typi that looks typically like. Typically something like yeah. this they would request like yeah. our own certificate of insurance yeah. as proof that we have coverage for that so. Mm -hmm. okay. And just um, going in for you know future agenda items is there a possibility at the September meeting we could just have a brochure, not a brochure, but what the parents see, what they sign off is that we could just take a look at it. We do that at the regional level. Mm -hmm. You know, we see, so it'd be, it'd be nice just to see, so we, if somebody asks us questions, we're going to have Apple Fest coming up before that type, before that event, so it'd be I'll nice give just you to my see. copy. Oh, <laughs> great. Okay. We'll give you some extra. So we, yeah, we can do that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And can I just lastly just thank uh, Malikan and the teachers. Um, if it we're not for the teacher's excitement around trying to continue this great experience for students. It would not happen. So um, I think one of the things that Michelle shared with me is that there's a lot of excitement amongst the staff to, to go. And um, I think the ecology school sounds like a wonderful place. And I know the two of you visited. So thank you for the field trip, the, the pre-field trip. Um, but just thank you because, again, without, without the support of educators uh, to make this happen, it wouldn't. Yeah, so. this is awesome. It is. 
A lot of good memories. Can I make, can I make, a, can I make a motion? Please. Uh, I move to approve the Malachi Middle School's sixth grade overnight field trip to Ecology School in Saco, Maine, November 6th through the 10th of 2023. Second. A motion by Bryce, seconded by Joan. Um, it will be a roll call vote. Is there any discussion? Hearing none. Uh, Lauren? Yes. Kristen? Yes. Bryce? Yes. Joan? Yes. And myself as a yes, so it's unanimously passed. Thank you so much and congratulations. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, very much. <coughs> Thank you um, for indulging us to yes. jump this mm -hmm. up for That's them. Um, we're going to go back to the two legislative update. Section D. Sure. So just a brief update on the state budget process. The Senate Ways and Means released its budget. Um, and again, the next step is to bring the budget to a conference committee where there are conversations between the House and the Senate to try to come to consensus before it's brought before the governor's desk. Um, I will share that the one significant difference with the House governors um, in the Senate budget is that uh, universal free meals was uh, funded in the governor's budget it was funded in the house budget not funded in the senate budget so we continue to advocate uh, for that um, our understanding is that it potentially will be funded through a different me mechanism and that's why it wasn't part of this the senate budget but we are watching it uh, very closely um, so I think it's important for us to continue to advocate that that is a priority for uh, the commonwealth and schools across um, you know the state um, and that is a quick update of the the budget process and conclusion of the legislative update awesome thank you so much um, moving on to food services budget and menu Great. so Keith Lavoie will provide a update on the food services department and I'm gonna just change it thinking about it. Hmm. I can do it. Try yours. Let me try mine. Uh, no. So I believe you have the presentation in yeah. your packet as well. Mm -hmm. So um, why don't we read through sure. the presentation and just sure. give people time to. And Kristen and Lauren, do you have the presentation at home? Or yes. Wherever you are. All right, great. All right, excellent. So I do want to thank the committee for, for this opportunity, um, you know, to kind of give an, an update of, of our food services uh, program. Um, the agenda that I want to cover this evening uh, actually has five pieces. The first is the status of the universal free breakfast and lunch program, uh, like Greg referenced, and where it is in, in the process and what we're looking for and kind of the impact that it will have. Also discuss our new point of sale system and menuing system, and the menuing itself is going to be launching for this upcoming school year. Um, also want to talk about our approach with some locally sourced food. That is a push that is being made by the Commonwealth, and we did receive a DESI grant for that. So we'll share a little bit more about our plans for that for the upcoming school year. I do want to mention menu enhancements uh, that have gone underway over the course of the year and certainly some staff development that has been linked to that. 
And then with the thanks of Becky and the finance department, we do have a, a, a good a comparison slide of uh, not only participation uh, for what, what occurred prior to the pandemic, but what we have now and the financial uh, situation that we are in as far as the food services department for the uh, schools of Northborough. So the status of free lunch, I think Greg covered it very well. I, I think what I would take from what or add to what Greg said is that things are a little bit unknown. We are hoping and we are very optimistic that universal free lunch will be approved for the 23-24 school year. And the hope is still alive that it will be a permanent solution. So we no longer have to have this conversation in May or June about what if. Um, I do think that that what if has created some trepidation for me and, and Becky as we are doing some long term planning. You know, if we did have free meals, we could anticipate the same rate of in participation, if not more. And therefore, it's a different landscape. But without that, we have to be uh, more conservative with the things that we're doing and planning for. Um, certainly, things like um, staffing and purchasing of new equipment, things of that nature. But I'll discuss that a little bit more um, down the road. The advocacy that the committee has done so far has been great. Um, also with Project Bread, I've been in contact with Project Bread uh, pretty frequently about the options. Um, so far, there wasn't anything that overly attracted me or I don't think would interest the committee. We've done what we can do up to this point, but I am watching it closely. We're monitoring the email exchanges that occur, and if there is an opportunity for the committee to participate, I'll certainly go through uh, Greg and to the chair to, to see if we can get a letter signed or you know, an email sent or something to that effect. But at present, I think they're in a holding pattern because they remain uh, very optimistic, which is uh, pretty exciting. The one thing to kind of know about universal free lunch, and it has been great, one of the things that we have seen a decrease in is the number of families that do apply for free and reduced lunch. That is still available for families, and we encourage it for families that are in need that they do apply for free and reduced lunch because it's not just about the meal. There are other benefits that come to it, like certain scholarship opportunities or waiving of fees or other ways that we can use that as a mechanism to support families. Um, the way that we capture those families now is really through um, the state and through what would be like a SNAP program. Um, we will we connect with, we don't do that three times a year. We're checking in with the state every month to make sure we're capturing all our families in need and, and um, um, having them captured properly and um, how I want to say it, designated properly uh, for our own systems through through power school. So as we as we kind of look ahead, you know, for the, for the summer planning, like I mentioned, these are all things that we're keeping a close eye on. Uh, we will be preparing the free and reduced lunch uh, applications uh, that will happen in July. Um, certainly looking closely and I think as soon as Becky and I get the email, we're going to be in contact with Kyle and you know, start uh, you know, moving forward with, with some of our plans, which may include an increase in staffing and, and certainly some uh, equipment um, changes that we might need to offset the, the increase of production that's required. So before I go on, is there any questions, because I know Greg mentioned it, is there any questions about the status of free or universal free lunch or kind of the impact that it may have? Joan, yeah. Is that just at the state level? Because the federal level, they cut back on it. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That is correct. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So it would not be a federal initiative. It would be a state initiative like it was this year. Okay. And is that guaranteed? Are you saying it's guaranteed for next year? It is not. It's still in. We, it's still, it's still in yeah, that was, session, yeah, so. part of the, it's still, um, the source of the funding has not been determined, although there's a lot of optimism. Okay. So we haven't gotten the word that school meals will be free for the 23-24 school year. Okay. That hasn't happened yet. And until that happens, you got a plan. But the we got a plan is, for is we A and haven't B. gotten notified that it's not happening. Correct. Yeah, I mean, I think and we so continue. I mean, obviously, yeah. The, yeah. the advocacy of the school committee sending a letter through Project Bread, um, yeah. advocating, advocating to our legislative delegation will all be um, continued important mm -hmm. um, actions as we move forward. Until we actually the governor budget governor signs the budget and um into law and we move forward and we know what's going to happen okay. thank yeah. you but we did hear as late as july which is what it has been so we're kind of used to that in yeah. fact I, even during the pandemic it was as late as august 28th it was late. yeah wow yeah i think bryce you remember that pretty vividly yeah. which was a great 
you know, it, it caused a lot of anxiety and stress, but in the end, it, it is absolutely the way to go for kids. I can say that. And I think a slide or two down the road here, you're going to see the immediate impact that that has had. So I look forward to sharing that. So as far as improvements that we have made, uh, these are two things. That one is, uh, the one on the left is already in place, and the one on the right is coming for the 23-24 school year. So we did adopt uh, Nutra Kids uh, online method of a point of sale system called mosaic that required a hardware upgrade which is uh, part of what you see on the left which is an interactive screen for our cafeteria workers to use as well as a keypad for students to pin in their student id numbers this gave us the accurate accounts required uh, to make sure that we were properly getting the reimbursement for the free meals. So even though this, this can be a cash system or a credit system, it is one that we use for the accountability of all the meals that go through our cafeterias, including any a la carte items. So that's been very exciting. Uh, we're no longer depending on a server that's at the high school. We now have a cloud-based solution that has provided us with a lot other uh, reporting abilities um, and, and syncing with our um, power school um, student information system so we adopted that in november we did staff uh, training on the november 8th or 9th pd day but stephanie remembers that and we were starting with it the next day so it was um, a quick turnaround but it has been a success and obviously it's been in place for more than six months the addition also that's coming is uh, we are uh, adopting a new menuing system at present we use a menuing system that is quite archaic and it, it does create uh, PDFs that you would see posted on the website very common people might print them and throw them on their refrigerator this is a more interactive menu that we're going to be launching for the 23-24 school year and it may work let me see if I can well, that's what I was I was gonna bring up actually the point about the one that they post right now it's not like mobile friendly correct so like you have to create a PDF in order to print it out and yes so, so you won't have to deal with that anymore. Correct, and it and is mobile so friendly. We, so we've yeah. had NutriSlice, and we've on the, but there's like been dual menus. Yes, the NutriSlice, which is this similar like type internal. of this, this which is interactive, or, and we've also been producing PDF, old school Menuing. menus. Yeah, or that's going away like completely, and now things. we're driving everyone to these interactive. So menus. now it's a uh, now it's more of an. Yes, so everything that NutriSlice is doing is now going to be part of our, our menu viewer here. So if you, you know, and if you hover, you get, you know, get not only a little description of the item, you also get the nutritional values here and the allergens that are listed below. So this is what the combination that we had before. All this information is currently available of what we have, but you got to do some hunting and it's not user friendly. We're really adopting a system that is now far, you know, far more user friendly for our families. So we are looking forward to that. And right now, Kyle um, and our food services manager at the high school are building that. Could you, so, if you scroll over the entree, what information does it give you? It gives all the nutrients as well as the allergens. It does. It does. It'll wow. pop up. Okay. Yep. So we are excited for that to launch um, for the 23-24 school year. The next item, and this is, I think, uh, something that uh, I think we're all interested in in a variety of different ways. I did mention in my opening that the district was um, fortunate enough to receive a grant through DESE, through the Massachusetts Farm to School Program, uh, for just over $8,000, which really is a focus on getting locally sourced items, including seafood, produce, fruits and other things that would come, I think the, the threshold are 200 and, and 400 miles, but really looking towards local vendors to provide us with, you know, uh, more variety, which is obviously something that we're striving to achieve and, and bringing things to a more local basis. So this has always been um, a goal of the program. We have reached out to and participated on different levels with some of the local farms that are listed there on the left, including Chestnut Hill, Tugas, and Bavarians. Uh, most notably, uh, Tugas Farm, we are able to purchase apples in the fall, but unfortunately they have monster apples that are too big and exceed any of our nutritional values that we can have. Too, too many sugars because the, the apple is just too large. So we say, please give us your small ones. We've worked it out. But that's a good problem to have. Yeah. Um, it really is. So that's been one of the exciting you know, sources that we've been able to figure out so far. But I really think this grant opportunity is going to open up that door for us um, and look through different procurement methods of, of getting locally sourced food because that has been a barrier before. A lot of locally sourced farms and, and things of that distributors aren't able to keep up 
with the national change in the price points that more national or regional um, vendors are able to provide. So this is an exciting opportunity for the district to get involved with. Kind of coupled with it, and these are things that we have discussed before, is we do participate in uh, collaborative contracting where a variety of different um, you know, school systems and institutions will band together for the procurement process to make sure we're getting the best price point we can for, for the food that we have. And trying to maximize that and, and have it be high quality is um, one of the challenges that we have, but certainly something that we've been able to, to achieve. And, and then benefiting also from federally subsidized options like the brown, uh, brown box options that are available to us through federal subsidies. A nice balance of that because those are foods that the, the government is able to provide. You know, it ne doesn't necessarily the best stuff that comes comes through, but we're able to blend it with some creative recipes uh, that we've been able to use and, and keep our, our cost of uh, production low. So those are things that are kind of happening on from a source and, you know, commodities and distributor level. And I am excited about the, uh, the grant, Kyle is too, and we've already started some procurement methods to see what we can achieve with that. So menu enhancements, um, you know, I think one thing we've mentioned prior in prior presentations about food services is that the supply chain was was a very big obstacle during the pandemic. I can say that that has been that has improved. It isn't back to where it was, but it is more predictable. There are things that we know that we can get, which then allows us to build in some creativity to to the menus, which is great. So we only see that improving as the months and and years turn over. So what we've been able to do is when we have some predictable supplies, our uh, cafeteria managers are looking to recipe development. There are some creative things that they have tried over the course of the year, especially here at Melican. I want to give credit to Brian Lawrence and, and Kyle Parson for their work in those recipe developments as well as the staff. They're interested in bringing new items to our, to our students. Um, and the way that that process would go is absolutely a taste test. You know, there'll be a trial period. They'll do recipe development and it never starts the way that it ends. And the hope is that those items ultimately become integrated into the menu. Um, and that's something that we're striving to do more and more frequently. Um, I do want to show some of the items that have been worked on. Hopefully this behaves here. Let's see if this works well. So we have explored a ramen bowl here. That is a combination of some commodities with, you know, different spices to bring bring forth and enhance the broth. Oop, went too quick. Homemade cheese lasagna with a homemade garlic knot has been um, shared here at Melican. Do they? I'm noticing the trays. Um, yes. Are they reusable trays? That yes, they do, those they are reusable okay. trays, and we've been able to purchase replacements because they don't last very long when they're going through the dishwasher and so forth. So okay. that is one of the new trays. Okay. Uh, Cuban sandwich. An open-faced hot turkey sandwich, and then that is a homemade mashed potato uh, with 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 seasoning. And I heard that this was the mashed potatoes were a hit that day. <laughs> and this is a nice uh, option here. Uh, this is uh, a spinach arjo tip, which was new uh, for the the cafeteria th this year, um, and some homemade uh, granola as well. So this is a nice combination of some of the creativity that's being uh, exhibited. Um, with our program and then obviously the more traditional uh, pizza above and now is this would this be just at Melican they don't have these types of like that some of these items are getting to the elementary school but very very few okay. and there's a combination of reasons why um, mostly like like I mentioned these are more the experimental menu items mm -hmm. that and I think we've had conversations that we want to see more of that down at the elementary schools um, because you know those are our younger eaters uh, by the time they're in eighth grade they've already you know their palates are already developed so we'd rather have more of this development at the uh, the lower grades that's something that we're working on are all the kitchens capable of doing that at the elementary level no okay. and that's and one of the has a kitchen. yes there are uh, two two of our kitchens are able to do some t you know more production than others mm -hmm. but not all of them so we do have to do more of the production at the other schools and they are transported transported yep and then final prep is done you know at the schools mm -hmm. you know for 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 um, you know setting the trays would you say that's mostly equipment restrictions or staffing um mostly equipment, equipment in space 
um, I would say is mostly um, the obstacles, um, but uh, you know, not not staffing. No. So that's kind of a nice little uh, shot of some of the different items that are, you know, being explored. Um, mostly, like I said, at the Melican School, but in, in general. One thing we want to make sure we're paying attention to is continued staff development. Just like we do for our teachers, we want our staff to have a continued professional development. We did go through the process of getting everyone up to date with their serve safe credentials, which is important. Uh, that was renewed this year. And then we go back. We are looking at the workflow. I mean, the production is greater than it's ever been, and we are looking at that workflow. So there are certain pinch points that we're evaluating to make sure that we have the proper skills in place and that we're doing the t proper team building so people know that if they are feeling the strain of producing 150 sandwiches in, in, in a morning, that we share that responsibility. So that's a lot of the staff development that's being done. It's being done a lot of hands-on, but we are taking advantage of the professional development days and opportunities where we're not serving uh, to build off of that. So that's an ongoing goal for the department. And I think the next slide is what you've all been waiting to see, which one that I was eager to um, review more deeply, is the participation rates. And I can say that our participation rates have gone up over you know 20 percent from prior to the pandemic to now. This slide gives you a good little based on the annual, uh, the average dailies uh, for the program back in 2019 compared to 2022. Um, we did see that increase, and, and I would argue that as this year has progressed, that number is, is probably creeping towards 70% uh, participation. And that would equal what, what I'm hearing at the state level. So at the state level across the board, they're seeing uh, an increase in participation, and it's hovering around 70%. <clears throat> so we're very close to that. We're matching it. So that's pretty exciting. But it has had an impact. We're producing more meals. There's more demand for the food, making sure we have the supply necessary. The equipment is being taxed because they're producing more. And our staff is, you know, working extra hard to make sure that they can meet that demand. So it does have, a, it does have an impact. Now, yeah, please, go ahead. Um, the increase is, is phenomenal in that short period of yes. time. Are you seeing that because of the more homemade food that's being made at Malican, is that that has increased higher, the participation, or is the participation about the same across the it, I think it has everything to do with it being a free meal. Free meal, okay. Yep. There are days, I will say that as we are tracking certain days, there are popular items and some of those are new items. So that's the daily review that's done by our CAF managers and Kyle is to really review what menu items are moving. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination. But overall, I think the benefit for families, um, including my own, to have a free meal is something that can't be understated. And I would estimate that that's, that's accounting for the vast majority of this increase. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I have another question. Please. Uh, when you talked about the slide that has locally sourced, which yes. is just on Hill Farm, Tugas and Bavarians. Mm -hmm. Has have you reached out to Wegmans at all in the months when these farm stands are closed? We we have not. Um, not not as of yet. I think that might be a good idea. I, we we've also um, th there have been a lot of a lot of times is that local or more of our locally sourced items won't have the volume that we would need on that given moment. Mm. They might be able to provide you know lettuce you know but the volume that we're requiring isn't just for a family of four to make a salad. Okay. So I think that's one of the obstacles that we have. And also our growing season here locally mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily align with the school year. Mm -hmm. So there's some factors with that as well. So it, it's a balancing act. But there are, there are more opportunities here that we have not gotten to. Um, and typically one of the barriers is, is the price point. Like those heads of lettuce would be mm -hmm. too expensive for us to be able to obtain. So we have to go to a more regional or national vendor. And I think, Keith, too, I think with this program that there are specific farms that we can purchase from. The That's state right. has designated who we can work with. Um, oh, they have? Yes. And yeah. it's, okay. and just to, for clarity, it's not just produce. Yes, it's not. Correct. 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 It's, uh, you know, it, it can be any, t well, in, including seafood, which oh. would be exciting. Land, land or sea. Land Look, or sea. Long as key, long. Key, wor key words, locally sourced. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, which kind of segues into 
what our mm -hmm. our question from the audience was earlier mm -hmm. um, about developing the food for all families yes. and all things. I know part of it is we're required to have certain things, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, I think the state, but is there more wiggle room? Like, can we do more? Uh, I mean, just a so couple comments. Um, the first is that I think we have a real opportunity, you know, with 70% participation. Yeah. Um, you know, that is really a, a large market share of our customers um, participating in our food services and lunches specifically. So it's really an opportunity for us to now look at, you know, how can we um, create menus yeah. where kids, our customers are eating high quality, nutritious meals. Mm -hmm. I think that the nutritional values that are provided um, from the state mm -hmm. and national levels are the floor. <laughs> Okay. Uh, it shouldn't drive our manuals. Yeah. Um, so I think that's something that we're looking at. Um, but again, I think we have an opportunity. We have a market share right now, and now we need to make sure we're putting the best product, the most nutritious product that meets the diversity, the windows and mirrors of our community. Yeah. It's absolutely true. Yep, I think there's definitely room for improvement in that area. Um, and so, you know, the, and like Greg said, this is the opportunity that's in front of us. Mm -hmm. You know, it was very rare that we had this level of, of participation. It didn't exist. It was below 50%. Yeah. And with that came a lot of different constraints. You didn't have as many options. Now with this, I believe we're having more. But this is all opening up to us now, which didn't exist in the past. So it is exciting, and it does, you know, the... Um, the audience member's comment does ring true with exactly, and I did a lot of nodding because I don't disagree at all. So I would also add that, um, you know, I think there are districts pre-pandemic who've done an amazing job with their food services and have, have kind of accomplished where we're headed. Mm. Um, I would say that the conversation um, was pre-pandemic. We were talking about <laughs> menus right. and food quality and, and procurement and so forth. So, um, you know, I think for us, for our district, the conversation was paused. Um, and I think at this point, we're now having the conversation again. And there's some other logistical um, mm. opportunities that we have, you know, working closely with um, surrounding districts and capturing their expertise to see how they've accomplished some of the goals that we're trying to achieve are areas that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. And the other big change that we're looking towards uh, ahead for, I see you there, Chris, in one second, is um, serving uh, breakfast at each of the schools. Right now that is just done at Mellican and Proctor, but we are anticipating that we'll be uh, able to serve breakfast at all five of the schools for the and start of the 2024 school year. Is it just like a bagel, like Cereal, dry cereal type thing is that what breakfast is there, been or those do they do like hot breakfast it would it will unlikely be hot breakfast okay. because of the time that's allotted usually it's more of a a grab and go okay. for as best we can but that variety of options that are even coming available here at the middle school is expanding so i do see that i don't see us having omelet stations anytime soon but certainly i think there's a variety that needs to be achieved there yeah kristen Import, sorry, after. okay sorry Thank you, and, and thank you to all the staff who work on this. I love the free lunch program, and it makes my life so much easier, um, and and all that it provides for all the students. I was just thinking and wondering, uh, in regards to the audience sharing, which had just come up, if there also, in addition to what you had just discussed, maybe be a look at um, logistics in a way to make it obvious to the staff who were working there that day serving the lunch who has certain dietary needs and who doesn't um, without maybe the child having to verbalize it or something because it sounded like from the audience sharing that there are options like like pasta without the meat sauce, mm -hmm. for example, um, but when the staff are very busy and they're serving a lot, I imagine it's hard to know who needs that. And I can also imagine a child very um, unlikely to verbalize that when maybe necessary. So maybe there might be some sort of logistical way behind the scenes to make that um, easier on both the staff and the child so that those options can also be taken advantage of um, and open up more opportunities. Yep, and in some cases you're absolutely right. It is a it is a private matter, you know, that we want to make sure we're protecting that. But I know there is a lot of work between the principals, the teachers, and the food services staff to make sure that they're doing all that they can, although, you know, meeting the volume, but meeting the uh, specific needs of kids. And I know a variety of different special things are done. It's not just about 
um, you know, whether it be vegetarian or not. There's a lot of different um, variations that are required for students um, to make sure that, you know, their um, food experience is a good one. You know, sometimes students don't like trays. There are certain students that don't like trays. We've adopted to that. So those are the types of things that in the specialization that is there. Um, and it would be, you know, um, certainly if there's anything special that's required, I think we do anything we can to accommodate. And I'll just add that we have an opportunity too in our schools. We are s relatively small elementary schools where yeah. um, our faculty and staff, including our food services staff, can get to know kids. Um, they they see them every day. Um, the computer systems that we have in place allow for information to be shared confidentially around um, certain needs. So I think um, I think there are many opportunities that we're very excited about, and I think that um, I, I think we need to take advantage of where we are and where we want to head because that might not exist um, in the future. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. Right, Kate, through any of your newsletters, have you ever done a survey to parents to ask if students are allergic to certain things so we had a percentage or how many would prefer that their students be vegetarian? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, we have not recently. I think the Food Services Department, Kyle Parsons, have has surveyed families yeah. in the past around menuing. I think that um, it's probably a bigger community conversation. It's actually working with our families closely around, you know, what are some options in terms of menuing, um, you know, around Ramadan and, you know, and um, belief systems. So I think it's a conversation um, that we need to kind of embark on as a community. Um, and I think in general, what type of um, food services program do we as a community want to provide for our students and families? Mm -hmm. That's a, that's not just a school system question; it's a community question, because mm -hmm. it also might mean looking at um, you know if it's free, <laughs> um, that's one thing. But if it is not free, it's you know looking at what is the, the price point for creating a really good lunch for kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. That's accessible. That's, that's accessible. Mm -hmm. yep. Go ahead, Bryce. Don't oh. we do have that information as part of our um, health forms that we send out at the beginning of the year? We do ask about food preferences or food restrictions. Oh, you do? Okay. So the nurses do have that information and do share it with the cafeteria staff. Yeah, right. That's yeah, they're pretty well versed on it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just going to kind of layer on to that. Depending on how you run the line, whether the pin gets entered first or last. Yeah mosaic all of the all of the school lunch programs have notes by student mm. oh wow right. so but it depends on how when they pin <coughs> yeah if right? they're if, if they're, they're entering pin, the, the pin, pin at the end then so if, they oh, pin, okay. if they pin as they enter the line then they're they know every student's deal as soon as it but if they wow. pin as they're exiting mm. they don't it know. comes back to okay. Kristen's point of like a student then self-advocating and so they're 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 I'm sure Kyle is uh, well trying to wrap his head around mm -hmm. that uh, a couple other things I'll say just to point out because we do say kind of free lunch or free breakfast and to your point earlier uh, Kelly you know it's two and a quarter maybe 250 for breakfast yep and it's 385 for lunch like three dollars and 85 cents that's got to cover your labor your food cost and luckily the schools don't charge the kitchen's rent so they don't have any overhead but Consider labor and food cost of what you do at home to go into three eighty five three dollars and eighty five cents. So I say that out loud to both this group and to anyone listening. Um, you know, to Keith's point, participation is the way towards a better program. Mm -hmm. The ability to aggregate the total dollar spend from the state and the federal to build out a better program. We do have to kind of eat our way there. <laughs> uh, and so I just say that to this group, but also to anybody listening as we kind of move forward with some of these lunch and food discussions, that it is participation driven. I know it's, it's, it's so like, because you think like, oh, if it's less people, it'd be better, but it's actually more people better because then you can get more for your dollar. Like That's correct. Can, yeah. So it's, you know, some people would think that. Oh, well, it's easier. It's less people they have to deal with if mm -hmm. I don't do it. Margin on a school actually. meal is probably about four to eight cents. Yeah. It's 
crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. Speaking so of next week, we <laughs> want your families to, it's $3.85 per person. That's create a meal. <laughs> Create a dinner. Good exercise. Like try to <laughs> try to do exercise. it. Add your time as labor. Yeah, and see see what you can do. Yeah. Okay. But uh, you know, I think food services staff they care. They care about kids. You know, we had a retirement today. Yes. Um, just an example of the quality person that's working in our in, in our kitchens across the district. Yeah, big thank you to all those. And we, and we want it to be a good experience. So it is about the menu item, absolutely, but it's how, you know, students are treated through that opportunity. That That's a key point. So, you know, that's part of the start staff development. There's a high level of customer service there, and it, it does go down. Like I mentioned the story about, a you know, a student that didn't want their lunch served on a tray. You would think, that, oh, well, that, that, that's a ridiculous request. But no, it was a real thing, and guess what? That student participates every day because we bag it for him, period. So we made it work. I know I liked I like Bryce's point about when you scan and the things like I could see for a child who if it wasn't I don't know if it's feasible to do that but if you were to scan and give a pin and you see oh this kid has a thing well you give them a red you know a red index card and then they just have to give that card to the food person or something like that you know what I mean like to help things yeah, like you often don't want to like you know, flag any kind of yeah, right. Things, yeah. right but but to but, but to Keith and Greg's like point that. like the schools are small enough where within mm -hmm. like 90 days yeah. the, the 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 staff on site know all the kids like yeah. it's it's incredible how fast those staff members yeah. so you know but but to know the information as they're coming yeah. to you instead of getting it as they're leaving the line. Yeah, and there's a high level of collaboration, like Mary Ellen mentioned, there's a high level of collaboration, especially yeah. at the start of the year, of reminding you mm -hmm. know, staff about things, developments yeah. that occurred over the summer. You know, that is a large part yeah. of the, you know, the onboarding process of a school year, yeah. and there is a lot of conversations between you know, the main office, our nurses, and our lunch people to make sure that we're yeah. crossing those T's and dotting those I's. Yeah. So the last thing I'll just add that, um, you know, we recently had a meeting about food services and kind of, you know, what is our vision? And I think that um, something that came up that resonated with me and Keith and Kyle had already thought about doing this, but really making um, the process of students selecting meals a family opportunity. Mm -hmm you know, Sunday, sitting down with a mm -hmm. menu and saying, here's the menu for the week. Let's yeah. talk about what your choices are and why. Yeah. So it, it's really, if we can get to that place where it's really a family activity at, at the elementary level, mm -hmm. um, I think it's, A, it's great for the family, and B, it speaks to, you know, are there options that meet the family's wishes and, and you know, cultural um, beliefs. So I think, I think we're heading in an exciting place. Now it's just getting there. It's yeah. getting there quickly. All right, there's no voting or motions needed on that. Um, I do want to make a note that at um, 8.28 p.m., uh, Lauren had to sign off. She so she is off the meeting for tonight. So I will not be calling her name anymore for voting on things. Um, the next thing on the agenda is the subcommittee liaisons. Um, so what my suggestion would be is that we do just the, like the, the few things that have to be addressed. Um, we need to have some record of some certain things for the summer type things. And then the other stuff, maybe everybody like food for thought, like think about really where they want to be and what they want to do and what they can help out with. and not help out with. So the only one I, I, <coughs> I don't see on here, Kelly, yep. is the, the new LPAC. Yeah, is it, uh, this might, this is last year, so yeah. this oh, is, okay. so that's not added. So that one okay. is going to be added to it. Um, I think the... Um, because this was published um, from last September. The okay. one that is required um, is the payroll, payroll the and warrants. warrant signatories. Yep. And we, we have two standing members already. Yeah, um, on that subcommittee. So I'm fine with my, continuing doing it. Bryce, I'd like you? to continue doing. Yeah. It. Okay. So my recommendation is we'll, we'll continue with, with that, okay. and and then um, I think we'll reorganize this and get this back out, and add LPAC and yep. clean up, and then in September, yep, we can uh, make appointments. I don't think anything's going to happen between now 
in September where that we need it. And I feel like we have enough um, remaining active members that if something needs to come up, mm -hmm. we can pull it together. Okay. Do we need a motion? <coughs> to I don't think there's any motions or anything that needed for that um, since we're remaining the same okay. for the warrants. Right. I think we're good. Thank you for asking. Um, all right, old business, none at the time. Superintendent's report to the committee. We have enrollment. So in your packet is the enrollment report as of May 18th, 2023. So we are monitoring enrollment very closely. Um, our, typically the grade levels where we see increased enrollment are K and one um, in terms of move-ins. I will note that our kindergarten enrollment is um, less than it is typically at this time of year uh, from years past. So we're watching that. Um, the grade level where I'm concerned about a class size is first grade. We are still within the class size um, policy for um, class size in grade one. However, we're right at the threshold um, at the ceiling, so we're watching that closely. Um, one opportunity that we have because of the kindergarten enrollment, um, if it stays as is, would afford us to be able to, if we need to, shift a K teacher to first grade and open another section of first grade and um, again, be within the school committee's class size policy. But it is something we're monitoring on a, a daily and daily basis. basis. Also, any questions? Also in your packet is the FY23 monthly general fund expenditure report and just want to um, take a minute to thank uh, Becky and the finance team. Um, so, uh, had a very successful fiscal year managing the budget and also um, the preparing to launch a new upcoming um, budget season and budget year. So just want to publicly thank Becky and her team for um, the great work managing the finances, which ultimately impact what students experience in the classroom. Becky. Unbelievably, we have just over three weeks left in this fiscal yes. year. I can't <laughs> believe it. Um, <laughs> So the report in your packet is as of May 31st, um, 2023, we had just under $90,000 remaining on the bottom line or 0.34% of the operational budget. We did make some adjustments um, to our projections for heating and electricity um, based on the numbers that we had been seeing throughout the year. Um, but really overall, I do think that the rest of the line items are right in line with where we expect them to be. Um, we are in the final stages of closing out fiscal year 23, as Greg mentioned. Um, and so I do really want to thank um, the principals, the staff, the leadership team at Central Office um, for all of their assistance with the FY23 budget. Um, their cooperation really has been instrumental in closing this out successfully this year. And I'd also like to recognize Pam Roberts, who is the new financial, not new, I guess she's closing out her first year with us. Um, she did start with us at the beginning of the fiscal year in North Row, and she's really, um, I think, picked it up very quickly and has done a nice job um, in her new role um, with us on the finance team. So um, we're looking forward to FY24. We did open the budgets for schools to begin to enter purchase orders in um, last week so we're, we're well on our way for the close and also the open of the fiscal years um, do we have yes John. I'd like to make a motion yes I'd like to make a motion to accept the Northboro Public School District FY 2023 budget the monthly general fund expenditure report as of May 31st 2023 until audited second Motioned by Jones, seconded by Bryce. Any discussion? Hearing none, uh, it will be a roll call vote. Kristen? Yes. Bryce? Yes. Joan? Yes. And myself is a yes, so it passes. Yes. All right. Um, next on the agenda is school committee reports. I don't have any at this time. I don't have any either, believe it or not. Um, I don't have anything formal, but um, <coughs> NSPAC is, has new board members. Um, and they are in the summer. So we are actually meeting with NSPAC, I believe, tomorrow? Mm -hmm. 
a week from yeah um, a week from no, tomorrow. No, a week from tomorrow because it was to do some planning to and goal setting. Yeah. So. yeah. I think, can you go to that one, Bryce, maybe? Yeah, on the yeah. 15th. I think you're going to, yeah, because I was going to go to it for tomorrow, but then it got pushed, so. Um, uh, only other thing is, <clears throat> which I had a note for it, and now that I'm starting to talk, I'm realizing that I did make a note of what I was supposed to mm -hmm. talk about. We had a solar meeting. <laughs> we did have we a did. solar meeting. Um, yeah, we had a, a, actually a, a well-attended solar meeting mm -hmm. to kind of reboot that uh, um, the group that we've had ongoing now for, what, six years or so, give or take, I think. Um, but, uh, you know, we did talk about the success of the Algonquin project that, you know, happened, uh, you know, was turned on just over a year ago, 18 months, I think, in total. And then we're trying to make some, do some good planning for what's up ahead. So I think at the, uh, the outcome of that meeting was that, you know, the committee would like me to do some more work and get organized around what options are available uh, for our facilities uh, for solar and other energy related um, type projects so it's exciting uh, to think about and I believe that we will have something to report in the fall yeah yeah it was very good meeting um yeah we have like three projects ahead that we were pushing forward to right. explore I found my notes I was like I know I need notes to say things <laughs> yes, but yeah so they're gonna reach out to some companies for bidding and exciting. so lots of options and that, that work has already begun already done the outreach I would I wouldn't expect anything less. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, uh, no other reports. Um, we already did educational policy. Um, there is no policy development at this time. Personnel distribution of personnel report. Yes. Yeah, so in your packet is the personnel report, and you'll notice that we are in the process of um, hiring faculty and staff for the upcoming school year. So we've. Um, we are in a very good place in terms of hiring for launching the 23-24 school year. Um, a, a couple of retirements, a retirement listed to Dominique uh, LaPaul that we have met today, and then a couple leave of absences, and then um, some resignations. Typically this time of year what we see is P uh, ESPs typically um, who are um, hoping to become educators um, are landing jobs and um, leaving us for um, other aspirations. So we will, this is typical and we will, um, we're confident we'll be able to fill those positions moving forward. All right, uh, no communications at this time. Actions on minutes, we have Several. Yeah, can we bundle? Yes, I clarified with. Okay. Yes, I okay. clarified with um, Cheryl. Yeah, some helpful, but you want me to do it? Uh, yeah. So we can do so. The ones that we can bundle, and there's ones we can't bundle. I okay. think so. We can basically bundle one through four, um, and then because those are the same type of thing, we're just voting to approve. And then number five is approve and release and then number six. So it's three motions, basically. All right, you ready? I'm ready. <coughs> uh, I move to approve the special open meeting minutes of January 23rd, 2023, the open meeting minutes of May 3rd, 2023, the capital, plan the capital planning subcommittee open meeting minutes of October 11th, 2022, and the Operational Budget Subcommittee Open Meeting Minutes of December 19th, 2022. Second. Motioned by Bryce, seconded by Joan. Any discussion? All right. Um, Kristen? Yes. Bryce? Yes. Joan? Yes. Myself as a yes. <coughs> Those are approved. I motion to approve the executive session minutes of May 3rd, 2023. Approve and? Approve and release. No. No? Uh, I didn't know if we're releasing this. Yep. We are? Okay. This, this <coughs> one, it says approve and release. Yeah. Number five. Okay. Not on your, not on your packet, but. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> on, on the packet, like I have it. Okay. It's the memo one. Okay. Okay, have you. I see it. Thanks. Yep. 
Did you read, did you finish motioning it or no? I'm just doing five, right? We're doing five separate from, so, so I move um, to approve and release the executive session minutes of May 3rd, 2023. Second. Uh, motion by Bryce, seconded by Joan. Any discussion? Okay, hearing none. Um, oh, I see how that is. Um, Kristen, sorry. Yes. Bryce. Yes. Joan. Yes. Myself. Yes. Um, and then so. I move to release the retained executive session minutes of September 7th, 2022, October 3rd, 2022, November 1st, 2022, the special meeting of December 1st, 2022, December 7th, 2022, January 4th, 2023, and February 1st, 2023. Second. Motion by Bryce, seconded by Joan. Kristen, any discussion? Kristen? Yes. Bryce? Yes. Joan? Yes. Myself? Yes. Okay. I think we did it. So can I just a general comment and a thank you to Cheryl Lefferi and Mariana at the central yes. office for uh, keeping all the minutes organized and um, it's a monument, monumental task and they do it very well and it's very important to stay on top of it. So a thank you to Cheryl and Mariana for uh, the person who takes the minutes for us. 100%. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, future agenda items. Lots and lots of things to do in the future. Um, we will have um, the committee assignments, committee assignments subcommittee assignments. Um, we will go over our action plan for what we want to see for you I think we started like um, a schedule for like who we want to present when. yes yep so we'll put the schedule back on the agenda put it back on the and agenda you and I can meet and talk about what schedule. that will look like we'll ha we'll be um, opening up the school year so the 20 so an update on yep. the, update the welcome back teacher and, update yeah. <clears throat> yep. we'll have an update then on the uh, food services Correct. Hopefully we'll have free lunches. Oh, the financing yeah, of the financing. services, yeah, yeah, for sure. Would it be too early to look at our budget goals? I think um, we'll go through the um, kind of the cadence of all of the items that we usually do. So we'll um, have Cheryl kind of look and add those. Okay. I think it's um, I think they're shared at the first meeting, and then just to for people to think about yeah. what goals we'd like to accomplish, and then. The subsequent meetings, we finalize those. Okay. All right. So, um, anything else that comes into mind, you can reach out to me, obviously, anytime. So, um, approval of bills and payrolls is all set. We are good. I got there before you did this. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I, was, I did see that. I was like shocked by that. <laughs> I thought at first I had to because I've been I'm always first, so I thought I had to sign off on it. Like you know how like Greg has to sign off on it before I sign off on it. So I thought like I had to sign off on it. But whenever I opened it up and I saw it, I was like <laughs> I almost texted you to say what's taking you so every, every <laughs> once in a while Becky needs to send me reminders to me. So, <laughs> it's been, uh, so you know, yeah. one thing that we were thinking about doing, sorry, is to yeah. like put together just to give you our payroll schedule so yeah. that you know. I mean, obviously it's every other week, but I don't know if that would, would be helpful. I would add it to my calendar for sure. Okay. If you sent the invites, I'd just pop them okay. right in there. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. a great idea. Okay. All right. Yeah. So I, I do, um, I put just a standard every other in my calendar, but I don't. I just do things, yeah. but yeah, yeah, it's helpful. Okay. Yeah. It's very helpful. Um, all right, any audience sharing? <laughs> Terry, do you have audience sharing? <laughs> I would love you to. So, hold on. As the chair of the um, Cultural Council, Weather permitting, 
um, on the town common on Saturday, so June 10th, 11 to 330, will be um, a beautiful festival of uh, three bands, three dance troupes, Greek, Turkish, local food, artists, and artwork assembled from the middle school here, courtesy of the art teacher here. So everything will be on display. The doors that are um, on display at Ellsworth McAfee Park, they are um, part of a silent auction and uh, local art. So it's everything's free. So it's just come, bring a blanket, bring a chair, come eat, listen, hang out. Just a day to relax, deep yoga breaths. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much, Jared. Um, it that kind of reminded me that I forgot to mention that they did release Apple Fest. Oh. And it's actually like the week of our meeting. So, so it's you, like early this year. Okay, so you and I can go through because we also have an MASC, you know, yeah. conference that we have to look at that in November. So, yeah. we'll, so the Apple Fest, I know the parade and. What day? What day? Okay. It's yeah. Is the parade still on Sunday? Um. Okay. Yeah. It's so usually it's like the weekend of like the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, but it's the week early, so it's September. So, but our September meeting is on the 6th of September. So, and then Apple Fest starts, I think, like the next day, like the 7th, 8th, 9th. So, okay. Um. That will be something just we'll probably coordinate. Send out a communication. And over the summer about that, yeah. just because we obviously, you know, we in previous years have had like a week or two to plan. But mm -hmm. now we just have one. Mm -hmm. And we got to do candy. Got to do <laughs> plan for a little. Sorry. Oh, uh, for, uh, for uh, <laughs> no, so Sorry. I think we march in the parade. and We march in the parade. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so in the school, uh, I think no, I but it's a good reminder. I was able to do it last year. You had your foot thing, I think. Oh, uh, I wasn't marching anymore. We used to throw yeah. candy and then. Yeah, I think we can do that. And we'll, um, I think I appreciate the heads up because we'll, we need to let principals know now so they can organize yeah. for the parades. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because as I said, it's, it's going to be early this year. Yeah. Okay. Like, yeah. I know I, d I saw that email and I like made a note wow. to say something. Okay. So, yeah. All right, um, so I think we are adjourned at 8.53. Do we have to do a roll call to adjourn? Yeah, yes. I move call. to adjourn. Okay. Second. Motion by Joan, seconded by Bryce. Any discussion? Roll call, Kristen? Yes. Bryce? Yes. Joan? Yes. And myself as a yes. Uh, we are adjourned at 8.53 p.m. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Kristen. Good night, Kristen. Good night, Kristen. Good night, Kristen. Good night, Kristen.